edition of the Traction Reaction Podcast. I'm Steve Zotke. Joining us, it is John Saltonstall, all the way from England. Uh, what part of England are you in, John? Um, I'm, uh, I'm I'm over in the Midlands, uh, Steve. So I'm in a county called Leicestershire, yep. um, which uh, is probably about 50 miles away from uh, Birmingham. So we're kind of in the middle of the country. Very good. Our, our, so, yeah, the Midlands, a lot of, a lot of good drivers. So Silverstone is your home track? Uh, my home track will be Donington Park. Uh, oh, okay. Is probably is probably the oh, there's a there's a really small track called Mallory Park that's probably the physically the nearest. But uh, mm. um, yeah, Donington and I, which was near where I grew up. I grew up about eight miles away from Donington. But uh, yeah, Donington is about fifty miles from here, and then Silverstone's probably about the same in the other direction. So yeah, we ha- we're yeah. we're quite well served. And and the reason why we're chatting is your fabulous new book on Jackie Eeks and uh is authorized competition history and kind of walk us through how this all came about and uh and what's the genesis of that right well well steve it was um uh, as a result of the first book that i did that we you and i had a chat a couple of years back about uh, a, a, a book done in the same vein about nicky louder um mm-hmm. basically looking at his career race by race and illustrating it and uh with with, with, with a photo from everything he did um, and that had been a project I'd worked on for a long, long time, maybe nine or ten years. And um, I'd always sort of it had always been an ambition to to get something to that stage. And I thought that if somebody thinks it's good enough to publish and somebody else thinks it's good enough to buy, then you know I'll tick that box of life ambitions and we can move on. And that that'll be great. I didn't expect the um, the positive response and the positive reaction that they came to the louder book and the critics particularly liked it and it got shortlisted for a few awards and. Uh, yeah, so I so I was, I was very humbled and gratified by that. But as a result of that, the uh, the publishers uh, asked me if I'd like to do another one, which was which was equally gratifying. Uh, and we talked about a few names, and the 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 ethos was always going to be it had to be somebody who got a, an eclectic career, you know, had raced mm-hmm. in a wide variety of things, uh, um, who who was underrepresented in, in 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 print, you know, who there wasn't much written about, but also who. Um, you know, who who had difficult parts of their career or parts of their career that were not well known. Uh, so we talked about a couple of names and uh, the editorial director, who's a lovely fellow by the name of Mark Hughes, said to me, um, he said, well, have you considered doing my favourite driver? I said, who's that, Mark? And he says, he says, Jackie X. So I thought, well, hang about. Um, very wide ranging career, you know, probably done nearly twice as many races as, as, as Lauder did. Um, very complex early career. I knew it, that he'd done a little bit. I knew a little bit that he'd done some motorcycle trials, but you know, didn't know anything about it. Um, I knew that he didn't want to be involved in it because for 30, 35 years, Jackie's refused to do uh, an autobiography. You know, he's he doesn't uh, unusually for an elite athlete, he doesn't like talking about himself. Um, so it kind of ticked all the boxes. Really, it was <laughs> you know, it was going to be difficult and challenging, but worthwhile. So I said, yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I, uh, I said it'll probably take me five years, um, but then along came the uh, the pandemic, and uh, that uh, that gave me more time in the evenings to do work than I might otherwise have done because I couldn't go out anywhere. So uh, so the research got done a little bit quicker, but um, that that was the reason why um, why we 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 chose Jackie and why why we started to work work it, work on the project. Um, after about 18 months of persuasion, probably two years of persuasion, I've been sort of lobbying at him to try through um, through his brother, Pascal, through um, one of his best friends, Willie Briard, through a guy called Dominic Drenot, who runs a sort of tribute website for him over in Belgium and in France. Um, uh, not getting anything back from Jackie at all. You know, he's, he was just not, you know, not, 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 not interested in, in looking at it. Um, until we got to the stage where the whole manuscript was uh, was virtually written and ready to go into editing um, at the back end of uh, 2021. Um, whereupon, out of the blue, I got an email from him saying, um, uh, I don't know who you are, but uh, um, you've been trying to get hold of me. Who are you? Um, so I, I said, you know, thanks very much for getting in touch. There's, there's about 30 questions I've got here that I think you're the only man in the world who can answer. Um, you know, it would be really great if you're if you're able to uh, if you're able to uh, respond. Um, uh, then there was silence. You know, 
Um, and his, his brother said to me, he said, oh, well, he says he knows you exist. If he wants to, if he wants to talk to you, um, he'll be back in touch. And a few weeks later, he came back and he said, uh, he says, OK, he says, um, I've seen any questions. We'd better have a Zoom call. And uh, we ended up um, organising a Zoom call the following day. And we talked for two, two and three quarter hours. Uh, and he says, OK, he says, he says, this, this is interesting. What, what happens now? I says, how does this process work? I said, well, typically what happens now is that um, the the publishers will send me a draft of each chapter when they when they've edited it through, and they'll ask me any questions and ask me, um, uh, you know, to, to clarify any things that they think might not be right or they want to know more about, uh, and I deal with those and um, uh, and we do it chapter by chapter. So Jackie says, great. He says, well, when you get them to edit and uh, to uh, post edit for to read through, he says send them to me and I'll have a read of them and um, I'll see if there's anything I've got to add. You know, I won't try and change any opinions. I said, well, that's fair enough, Jackie, because there is no opinion in here. It is just, you know, it's, it is just reportage, basically. Um, and literally, we then read, read through every chapter sort of together. Um, uh, some of it was done later done face-to-face. -face. Some of it was done by Zoom. But, you know, we sort of sat together and went went through each one and you knew you, you were getting somewhere because every so often you see a little smile go across his face. Then when you got that, then you knew, yeah, he's going to come up with something. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so 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 it all came together like that. And, and by the, by the uh, end of the process, he'd embraced it wholeheartedly and, and absolutely loved it, which was a something that we never thought that we'd, uh, we'd get him to do at the start. Yeah, it, it's fantastic when, when you look through it and – there, there is a lot of stuff that I think, uh, you know, there the average F one fan or uh, WEC, uh, you know, World Championship type fan might be surprised to see about him, and that's of course the uh, motorcycle racing early on in his career, and then it kind of evolves um, as a lot of drivers' careers did back then. You know, he he, he kind of went from motorcycles and then got into, the, I guess you could call it like saloon type racing and, and some hill climb racing and kind of walk us through how, how does one, uh, you know, I'm working on a book too at, at this time and, and you, you've done a lot of research, but um, walk us through doing the research, uh, especially like the, old, the older motorcycle racing and the saloon sure. type racing. How, how did that work out? Well, as, as you'll know from your own uh, exploits, Steve, it's, um, it, it, when drivers are unknown, when um, uh, you know when when nobody's heard of them, that's the hardest time to actually try and find any information about them. When, you know, once they became well known, then the journalists will write about them. Um, Jack, Jackie was kind of helped in that respect because his father his father was a um, a motorsport journalist and was was quite well known, so he had a recognisable name. So that 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 helped him in the first instance, but he, he talks a lot about his luck. He talks a lot about luck when um, when you when you interview him and how luck has played a role in his life. You know, he 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 seems to think he was lucky rather than skillful, but you know, uh, uh, most people would disagree with that. Mm -hmm. But um, he um, uh, to 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 explain about the how the research on the motorcycle stuff uh, evolved kind of requires you to understand about how his motorcycle career came about. He um, He'd been useless at school, um, as many sportsmen are. But he, um, his parents tried to encourage him in school by buying him better and better presents rather than by punishing him. And when he was about fourteen years old, they bought him a uh, they bought him a moped, which he started riding around through the woodland paths near Brussels, where he lived. Um, and eventually, badgered his parents into buying him or or lending him the money to buy a um, a fifty cc Zundap trials bike. Um, and uh, he was almost immediately successful once he started entering trials. He was very competitive straight away because he'd been because he'd been practicing and practicing around on this uh, on this moped through these woodland paths. Um, the thing with trials, of course, is that they weren't about speed; they were about balance and technique. The idea being that you you get you get around a course without putting your feet down. It was all about uh, poise and balance, and. Um, he, you know, as a side, uh, as a side issue to that, he reckons that it was um, learning to do that, ride trials bikes in wet and snowy conditions through the Belgian winters, and find grip where there wasn't any, where that made him a, a good wet weather driver. So, um, so that that's kind of um, 
how he got into into being successful on on bikes and he was competing his his main rival throughout his trials career was uh, was Roger DeCosta Oh, okay. Obviously, became a multiple um, yeah. motocross world title holder, and 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 guys who you know who you guys on 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 your side of the pond know very well. Um, but because he was successful quite quite quickly, the local press tended to carry quite a lot of reports about him. So, um, he he didn't make any of the sporting press very much. He, you know, the occasional European or or, or German language um, motorcycle magazine might carry something about him, but most of it was in local and regional newspapers. And I managed to uh, get access to uh, the Belgian National Archives. I literally I just spent I just read. <laughs> thousands of newspapers trying to find records of uh, of how he got on in these trials and then piece them all together to get the get the stories and then link them up um link them up with uh, some guys at the Belgian Motorcycle Federation who were hugely helpful um uh, and it, that that was also the same sort of story for hill climbs because again hill climbs were very lightly reported in any of the motoring press and it was only it was only the the, the ordinary regional newspapers that reported them but um he he got into hill climbs again he he would say it was lucky the the, the zundap importer um albert morkins who had um supplied him with his trials bike was also the um importer for bmw and Merkins had a little um, BMW 700, um, which was a very small rear-engined uh, family sedan type thing, um, and uh, he'd he'd campaigned this in in junior class. Merkins had, and he g- gave it to Jackie to to try it hill climbing in 1963. The very the very first hill climb that Jackie did was at a place called La Roche, um, and it was a, it was a wet day. Um, and La Roche was a sim- fairly simple course, but uh, the uh, the second corner was really, really wet, and something like thirty four cars crashed at this. Uh, the first thirty four cars all came off at this second bend, and Jackie was about the thirty fifth one along. Um, goes into it too fast, car slides sideways, clips a curb, uh, breaks a wheel, flips onto its side, breaks another wheel, bounces back onto its wheels, hits a tree sideways on. Door pops open, Jackie falls out, lands on his feet like a ballad dancer, right in front of a television camera, oh. um, which captured the whole thing. Um, and unusually for television imagery at that time, it was really good quality. Um, but uh, so before he's even finished a race, it's on all of the sports broadcasts on telly, this sort of rather spectacular accident and him popping out like an acrobat at the end of it. Uh, so as he put it, you know, I, before I'd even finished a race, everybody knew my name. Um, and allying that with the fact that he was already known from his, you know, pe- people knew who he was as a trials rider. Um, he got, he got some attention, but he was, he was very, very successful, very quickly, um, in, in hill climbs again. In fact, I think over the next couple of years, he, he did something like 34 hill climbs and won 20, 28 of them. You know, so that's, that's a pretty pretty impressive hit rate by anybody's maths, um, and he was he was picked up by Ford quite quite early on. They recognised his potential. In fact, he was the first guy to be given a um, a, a Lotus Cortina in um, in Europe, which caused a bit of um, which caused a bit of a, a annoyance with some of the other um, Belgian drivers. You know, who thought. That perhaps they should have been given the opportunity, uh, but uh, yeah, once he'd uh, one, you know once he once he got the backing of the Blue Oval, he was uh, he was kind of uh, away in the saloon cars. Uh, one could go through get their start in racing. Next thing you know, they're racing Formula One because by 1966 he's in Formula One, and yeah. uh, it's amazing how quickly a career could go. And unfortunately, some got snuffed out pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. But that was the sign of the times back then, wasn't it? Completely, Steve. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, we we're saying about luck earlier on, and he, he regards his greatest achievement as a driver, as as as, as to have survived, um, you know, the era in which he raced, because he, you know, he he had, he had three probably real major shunts uh, 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 as as a driver, um, the, the 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 first of which, um, in nineteen sixty eight when he was driving for Ferrari he, uh, at the uh, Canadian Grand Prix. He came into the pits twice during practice and said the throttles are jamming. 
and mechanics couldn't find anything of the, you know, either time. Came in a third time um, and said the throttle's definitely sticking. Um, and Julia Bassari, who was the uh, um, who was the chief mechanic at the time, said, "No, there's nothing wrong with it. You're fine." Well, next time out, uh, Jack, it was at um, Saint Jovit in uh, Canada, the Mont Tremblant circuit. Um, Jackie comes piling down. They start finish straight rise at the first corner. Throttles jam wide open. He goes straight through all the fences and uh, hits an earth bank at the end of it and bends the car in half. Was lucky to get it. He he, uh, he broke his leg. Um, he was very lucky that it was a clean break. Um, and the catch fencing balled up around the car. He was lucky it didn't catch fire because he wouldn't have got out of it. Um, <laughs> and Bossari afterwards said, uh, he said, He'd never forgiven himself because he didn't actually check the car. He just didn't believe there was anything wrong with it, so he didn't check it. Um, and uh, he, he sort of kicked himself for years that it could have been a lot worse. So that was just, that was the first nasty one that Jackie had. Uh, the second one was, was at um, at Spain in 1970 when um, Jackie Oliver's um, brakes failed in the BRM first lap at uh, Spanish Grand Prix. T-boned uh, Jackie's Ferrari and the whole thing went up like massive fire, huge, huge fire. There's um, there's a photo sequence in the book which sort of goes through it. You know, Jackie eventually managed to extricate himself, you know, overalls on fire. And um, fortunately, a local policeman came and beat out the uh, beat the flames out with his bare hands. Uh, but uh, in fact, the, the nastiest injuries Jackie got from that were for the fact that his overalls were drenched in uh, petrol. So he actually got fuel burns all over his mm -hmm. body. Um, but again, when so many drivers were killed in fire accidents at that time, you know, obviously Pierce Courage died in a fire accident that very year. Um, again, very fortunate to get out. And the last big one, of course, was in the States in 1976 at the um, uh, US Grand Prix at Watkins Glen. Um, he was driving for Ensign, a little British team, and um, the rear, rear suspension broke uh, as, he, as he was going down into the boot, into the anvil section. Um, the car turned right and hit the barriers pretty much head on, split the barriers in half. It was very much, very much like that Francois Severs accident. Um, and somehow the, you know, the car was ripped in half, but he, he somehow came out, uh, with badly broken feet, um, and, you know, escaped with his life. So he, you know, he talks about the fortune of having escaped, you know, survived an era that was really, really dangerous. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that part that luck plays, uh, plays in a driver's career, certainly something, you know, that, that was certainly three, three of his nine lives. Yeah, it certainly does. And, you know, from that though, you know, he moves into uh, endurance racing, a lot of success with the Porsche team. And, and that's, you know, it, it's almost a case of two careers because uh, Ferrari formula one drivers, you know, live on and they're forever popular. But the same thing with Porsche drivers, though, too. Porsche and driver, you know, Porsche drivers, especially those that won Le Mans, are have a are held in such a high regard. And he's been Absolutely. able to do both, hasn't he? That's it. And I mean, it's it's interesting that you make that point, Steve, about Porsche and the way it treats its drivers, because um, uh, both he and Derek Bell tell a, tell a story that you know uh, the the guys that. A Porsche to say, you know, once you're a Porsche driver, you're always a Porsche driver. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once you once you've driven for the factory, you're always you're always there. Uh, pe people really associate Jackie Jackie and Porsche as being synonymous names, but uh, he actually did more races for Ferrari in um, in Formula One and in sports cars than he did for Porsche. He did about 104 races for Ferrari and about 87 for Porsche. Um, but um, that transition from being a Formula One driver to being a sports car driver, they, they, his career was concurrent in both for a long time. As you said earlier, he he came into for, his first Formula One race was um, 1967 for, um, uh, for for the Cooper team. He did a couple of races, although he'd raced in Grand Prix in the Formula Two class in 1966 uh, uh, in Germany. Um, but from 66, 67 onwards, he was also racing sports cars. He was driving for the um, the JWA, uh, John Wires uh, team, which was running the GT40s for GT40s uh, with Grady Davis's uh, patronage through the Gulf Oil Company. Um, and certainly from 1967 onwards, he got a fantastic reputation as a sports car driver. Um, 
1967 Spa 1000 kilometres um, wet race, so it was playing into his strengths. But uh, he at, at the at the end of the first lap, the cars come round and Jackie comes out of um, uh, La Source, which is the hairpin right at the top of the track before the pits as it was then, down down past the pits through Eau Rouge up the Radion, out through Le Com, disappears out of sight. Complete silence. The crowd think, well, there's been a huge accident somewhere or what's been going on. 34 seconds later, Lucien Bianchier appears in second place in a, in a, a quick national Belgium um, Ferrari. So Jackie pulled out 34 seconds on the first lap. In, 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 in Unworldly skill in the wet, yes, but a brilliant sports car driver. So um, so even before he ended, I mean, he didn't, he didn't really start racing for Porsche until 1976, but uh, by which time he got he already got a, a pretty impressive reputation as a as a sports car driver. He'd won Le Mans in '69, obviously in the very close finish. He won it again in '75 for uh, for Mirage. Um, so yeah, um, fabulous sports car driver um, and incredible stamina. It's a fabulous book. It's over 600 pages. The, the photos are, are just magnificent. We'll, we've been posting these during the interview. And uh, the, especially the, the color is just so vibrant. This is done by Avro Publishing, which has done uh, uh, the David Hobbs book, uh, as well as several other books. They do fantastic work at ma uh, Master Craftsman in printing. But with, along with your uh information in there is it's just fantastic i, I highly recommend the book and i'm not just saying this because you're, you're you're sitting here but for for those that are it is on jackie x but it gives you a nice snapshot of the era uh and all the races too in that and it, it, it it's a fantastic book so how, how does one get the the book john um well the, it's available from the likes of amazon Obviously, uh, online, you can get it direct from the publishers at um, everopublishing.com. Um, a couple of the major dis major book distributors in the, uh, in the U.S. have, uh, have stocked it. It's, 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 in, it's in their warehouses now. Um, uh, and, and thanks to the great Judy Stropers, who's, uh, who's uh, put, you know, spreading the good word for us over there. And I really appreciate your kind words there, Steve, because... Um, a lot of effort has gone into making the book look and feel good as well as tell all the narrative. You know, the, mm -hmm. it, clearly it's packed full of stories about it, but the, the, that, that journey through photos is very important because what we've tried to do rather than just give lots of close cropped images of cars is to sort of push them back a little bit so you can get an idea of the environment in which they raced. Um, you can see the surroundings, you can see the conditions, and you, and you therefore see that whole transition, the journey of, you know, from, well, uh, looking at the cars in isolation from, you know, that's from the sort of pretty basic road circuits in the, in the early 60s through to the, uh, through to the autodromes in the, uh, in the 80s when his career ended and on the tracks. Oh, and what, what's nice about a book like this, too, is, is you know, it's not War and Peace. It looks like War and Peace. It feels like War and Peace. <laughs> it feels like War and Peace. <laughs> but what's, what's nice about books like this is you can pick it up, you can read a bit, you read it for 15, 20 minutes, whatever, whatever you're doing, if you get called away, uh, you got to go to a store, whatever you got to do, come back, pick it up a mm -hmm. day or two later, you can pick it up right where you can continue your journey through the, his career. So it's a fantastic book. Um, I think it fits in well to any motorsports library and is a is a definitely an asset to that. And John, we certainly appreciate you taking time out. Well, that's that's very kind of you, Steve. And uh, as ever, I always appreciate your support and and the time that you spare me to talk about these things. It is it's a, it's been a delight talking to you, and uh, hopefully uh, you can get over to the states. We'd love to chat uh, further in a pub somewhere. Well, that that would sound like a joy. I just need to. Uh, I, Get you know, get on a bit of a promotional tour to to find a reason to get over stateside and do and uh, and see you all. Uh, please do. We would love to have you, and uh, we'd certainly uh, show you around uh, Wisconsin, Road America, and and, uh, and elsewhere. Oh, don't come much better than that. All right. Well, thank you, John. Appreciate you taking time out. You've been listening to the Traction Reaction podcast. Don't forget to please like and subscribe to the podcast, and we'll check you out next time.